so good morning uh, everybody to this uh, to this webinar uh, my name is is Conrad Hall uh, I'm the chair of this session today and also the chair uh, of the SIP for LASAC code board uh, we've got close on 100 people uh, joined uh, the numbers possibly just ticking up slightly but I do want to get going because I'm conscious everyone will be busy and wanting to finish at, at 12 as well uh, just one or two very quick uh, housekeeping points, if I may. Uh, so the session is being recorded uh, so that it will be available on the SIPFA website uh, subsequently for those who weren't able to join. So, so by attending, you are consenting uh, to that uh, to that recording. Uh, we'll shortly move into a presentation from uh, Ian Murray, uh, SIPFA's Director of Financial Management, uh, and then move into questions uh, for which please use the uh, the Q&A uh, function on the webinar. Uh, we also have uh, other colleagues from SIP on the call to assist as needed, uh, and also Mike Newbury, uh, a director at the National uh, Audit uh, Office. Uh, I'm just going to say a word or two and then hand over to Ian for the main, uh, main presentation. Uh, I think everyone would accept uh, we clearly wouldn't want to be starting from here. Uh, the issues around local accounts and audit are, are well known uh, and uh, no need for me to uh, repeat them here. Uh, I think we can all agree that the current situation is untenable. We must do something in order to uh, to move it forward. Uh, but as I think, again, colleagues will know, uh, as soon as you start looking at actual particular options, uh, you know, all those pros and cons of each uh, do come very much uh, to the fore. Uh, so although the actions uh, will uh, depend on a on, uh, you know, number of players across the system, uh, I think there are three consultations live at the moment. Uh, what we're focusing on today is the SIP for LASAC uh, role in that and the consultation that's been launched uh, on changes to the, uh, to the accounting code. Uh, I think worth highlighting before I hand over to Ian, uh, and it's in the consultation documents. We you know, we do recognise that this is uh, this is not straightforward. Uh, there were some uh, quite uh, strongly uh, contrasting views at the board uh, on whether we should consult uh, on these changes at all, and that's a good thing. That healthy debate. Uh, I think perhaps the best way to characterise it is that uh, alternative viewpoint between whether we should continue to maintain a focus on the best possible uh, reporting standards, uh, or in view of the uh, uh, the challenges uh, at the current time, uh, accept that perhaps it's time to, to adopt the best financial reporting possible under the uh, under the challenging circumstances uh, that we find ourselves in. The only other thing I was just going to say by way of the sort of contextual background to that, uh, you know, these are uh, changes we're consulting on that we think can help in the very short term. Uh, that does not mean that the question about uh, the long-term future of local authority uh, accounts uh, and reporting has gone away very far from it. Uh, I think I'm, I'm very keen uh, to see us uh, make some progress towards uh, a set of accounts that more practitioners were more content uh, uh, were doing the, the, the job of those. Uh, but I think in the current sort of emergency situation, uh, our focus rightly has been uh, on what we might achieve in the short term. I'm going to pause there uh, and ho hand over to uh, Ian, uh, who will uh, run a presentation, and then we'll move into the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Conrad, and uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for, for joining us. Um, so uh, in terms of what we want to cover with you uh, this morning, um, this is this is the agenda. So Conrad's just very um, helpfully set out some of the context. Um, I think just uh, want to provide a little bit more background in terms of where we are, uh, then uh, share at a reasonably high level the the two options that are that are being explored through the consultation. I would like to provide you an update in terms of where we are with accounting for infrastructure assets, and then just talk through next steps. Um, we really are keen um, that if there are any questions, you have an opportunity to ask them. And, and as Comrade said, if you can use the Q and A box uh, to type questions in, uh, keep them coming, but we'll we'll pick them we'll pick them all up um, at, at the end. So uh, moving on then. So as, as, as you probably are all aware, there have been uh, a number of uh, joint statements over the last uh, 12 to 18 months looking at how to tackle um, the thorny issue we have in terms of local authority uh, financial reporting and, and audit delays. 
Um, and the most recent, uh, the most recent joint statement was at the beginning of the year, um, and it was uh, basically setting out the proposals in place to to clear the backlog and start to embed timely audit. Um, I think it's really important to understand that the the proposals are in three stages. Uh, and actually what's on the table at the moment, what's being consulted on by system partners at the moment is really dealing with uh, phase one and phase two. Uh, and uh, that's a reset. So uh, the proposal is that the backlog of historical audit opinions up to and including 2023 will be cleared by the end of September. And in a situation where those audits aren't complete, um, auditors will look at how they might modify or disclaim opinions so that those accounts can be can be published. There's then a recovery phase. Uh, so there's an acknowledgement that through uh, that reset phase, um, there may be modified opinions, there may well be disclaimed opinions, and that assurance needs to be built back uh, uh, built back a, a, over a period of time. Uh, potentially, uh, potentially, you know, uh, well, potentially quite quickly in some cases, potentially a lot longer in, in others, and it really will depend on on local circumstances. Uh, and the measures that SIT for LASAC are consulting on at the moment uh, uh, sit within the the recovery phase. So it's looking at what accounting changes might be made in that period um, for a two year period in, uh, initially for 23, 24 and 24, 25 to support that that process. And then finally, as comrades just said, there's a, an important piece of work around reform that um, that is happening, but that's not being consulted on at the moment. And that will look at actually what are the systemic issues, uh, what are the challenges and how do we get back or how do we get to something which is uh, a proportionate, uh, a timely financial reporting and audit in, in local government. So that phase three is really important, but it's um, uh, and work on that has already started. But it's the first two that the uh, the policy initiatives that have been uh, released over over recent weeks are designed to uh, designed to address. Um, and I should have said at the outset what we're really keen to get um, both from things like today, but also through consultation responses, is some understanding of what will the impact be of these proposed changes, both for preparers and auditors, um, but also. Um, you know, uh, what are the potential un uh, unintended consequences or unforeseen circumstances that um, that we haven't been able to, to, to take into account? So, as I said, there are a number of consultations uh, that are live at the moment. Um, uh, I think the DLUC and NAO consultations finished uh, the end of last week. Um, the sit for LASAC consultation has run slightly behind uh, those two for, for a number of reasons, which we can get into later if it's if it's helpful. Um, but it's designed to run to the it will run to the end of the month. Um, and as I said, there are two options that we're we're uh, keen to explore through that through that consultation. Um, and I think I'd also just like to emphasize we are talking about short term changes only. Uh, and there is also a very live question about whether they should reflect they should be uh, England only or whether they should uh, they should also uh, be permissible in the uh, the rest of the UK. So um, in very brief terms, uh, and we can get into the detail of this, um, but uh, but it is in the exposure draft um, that's uh, that, that's part of the consultation. We're looking at two temporary measures. Uh, we're looking at one set of measures, which is uh, trying to simplify the measurement for operational plant. Uh, property plant and equipment, although I think really we're talking about operational property, uh, and that will uh, permit the use of indexation, uh, which hasn't been permitted in local authority accounting uh, previously, but is permissible uh, elsewhere in the public sector. Uh, what we're hoping is that this will allow um, will allow some of the judgment to be taken away uh, from preparers in terms of. Uh, yeah, there's another option on the table, and, and I know that indexation is something that um, that preparers are using in conversations with the uh, with their auditors, but often not not being able to to book those adjustments. As part of the measures, uh, there is a consideration as to whether those indices should be um, mandated, or whether we should be, or someone within the system should be providing indices. Again, trying to remove the judgment uh, or, or make the judgment easier. Uh, in terms of which index to use for what type of asset, those sorts of things. And there are some questions in the consultation which we're really to, uh, keen to hear back on in terms of um, how that might work, who do we think is best placed to do that, uh, and what the overall impact might be. The second uh, set of measures is looking at reducing pension disclosures. 
and bringing those disclosures more in line with FRS 102 uh, rather than IS 19. So in particular, this would reduce some of the disclosures around um, sensitivity analysis and some of some of the the uh, some of the disclosures around sort of uh, the uncertainty, I suppose, in the underlying in the underlying estimate. Um, those I think have been slightly less contentious as we've taken them through stakeholders to date. But the first one, um, I think, as Comrade said, has there have been differing views about the desirability of that and potentially the impact it might have on uh, on users. So just to quickly update on infrastructure assets. So infrastructure assets isn't part of the consultation that um, that we launched uh, at the end of February. And that's because uh, we already had a work stream looking at infrastructure assets, uh, which is running in line with our normal consultation uh, timescales uh, in terms of changes to the code. Uh, so we will be consulting later on the year, uh, later in the year, in terms of uh, uh, what the recovery or what the process for a, a long term solution for infrastructure assets might look like. But what we can say now is it's it's almost certainly going to be deferred. Uh, we've been having conversations with DLUC and we have had some really helpful conversations with FRAB. Um, we know what we have at the moment uh, doesn't work in a number of places. We also know that the, um, you know, even if we were to, to stay with uh, with depreciated historical cost or historical cost, we know that that doesn't exist in a number of places. So some form of reset activity will be needed. Um, and it's just not, uh, it's just not sensible really to try and load that in uh, to a system which is also trying to recover uh, from the situation that that it's in. So we will be consulting on that later in the year, but the, the proposal that's on the table uh, at the moment is that, um, that the existing provisions in the code will be extended and the uh, the underlying statutory instrument is, is likely to be extended as well, so that that will be an issue that we'll come to as part of the recovery process uh, and not try to try to, or the, sorry, the reform process and not try to deal with uh, whilst the system is in is in recovery. So in terms of next steps, um, so the consultation was issued at the end of uh, last month. Um, this webinar is part of a wider set of communications uh, and uh, uh, we, we, I can't say it often enough, we think feedback is from local authorities and from, from others is really essential. Uh, as we worked through the material, uh, it was you know, the one question that you can't answer with any confidence is, well, what will the impact be? So we're really keen to understand that uh, as much as we possibly can. Uh, the consultation will run for a month. Uh, we've deliberately kept the uh, the consultation window short uh, because these are measures that um, if they came into effect would be for 23, 24, and we're aware that those accounts are, are already being closed in, in some cases and, and local authorities will be, will be gearing up for that. Uh, again, some of the timetable unfortunately hasn't been um, hasn't necessarily been completely within our control. Um, so we're aware that, um, that that these measures will be seen as late for for lots of preparers. So keen to do that as quickly as we possibly can. Um, we do need to go back and and go through a final set of deliberations. So obviously, sit for LASAC will will need to consider what's been uh, what comes from the consultation and what impact that might have on, on, on what they're, what, what's being proposed. Uh, we'll also need to have a, a further con conversation and uh, uh, we'll need to go through FRAB uh, as well to make sure that, that they're comfortable with the, the measures um, that are being proposed. Uh, and then what we anticipate is that there will be a, an update to the code, which we will get out as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, and we're hoping certainly by the end of, by the end of April. So, an awful lot of work to do in a very tight window, and we um, absolutely appreciate that um, uh, that this is less than ideal for preparers, given that some of these proposals might have an impact on accounts that are being prepared very shortly. So, really, that's all I really wanted to, to cover. I'm very keen uh, for for questions. I can see that there are a couple that have that have gone in the, the chat already, but. Very keen for um, you to have the opportunity to ask questions uh, or express kind of comments, uh, concerns at, at this stage. Um, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to or hand back to, to Conrad and, and he can hopefully lead us through uh, all of that. Will do. Thanks very much for that, Ian. I thought that was uh, that was really clear and uh, and helpful. Uh, so there's a couple of questions uh, in the chat. Please, please. You know, can I just encourage people. Uh, you know, this is your chance. So absolutely, uh, put uh, put more questions in there 
uh, if you want. Uh, I think there is also functionality in there that enables you to sort of like particular questions if there are ones that you want us to focus on on answering. Uh, but to kick off with, uh, I'm just going to go in the order that we've got them, which is quite helpful actually, because Richard Quayle has put uh, what I think is a very fair challenge in there. Uh, I'm going to read it out because I'm not sure if everyone can see it. So a personal frustration is that there is discussion about short and long term changes. Surely there has been enough research and opinion gathered on the problem areas and we can do a single change for recovery and reform. It feels like a step process that isn't moving fast enough to give everyone involved in the accounts process some motivation that real impact is coming sooner rather than later. Uh, I mean, I think you know, that is a pretty fair challenge. Uh, David from SIP for David Lyford Tilly uh, has put that he would like to uh, to have a go at answering that one. So, David, if I can hand over to you in the first instance. And then... uh, sorry, I was actually just marking that you were discussing it live just to. Oh, I see. We were uh, working on. I, I failed. Uh, so, the, uh, no, no. The, uh, so uh, I, w I won't put you on the spot there. I mean, as I say, Richard, I mean, I think that's a fair that's a fair challenge. I mean, the system is quite complicated, and I think that's why. Uh, we felt that we needed to approach it in the way that we did to do what we could to help in the short term, whilst absolutely keeping those longer term uh, issues uh, open. But I mean, I I, I acknowledge your uh, your viewpoint and, and and your frustration. I think it is a fair challenge. Uh, Ian, uh, I don't know if there is anything you would like to to add on that one. No, no, I think it's a I think it's a fair challenge. I think. Um... So I, 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 and I understand the frustration in terms of sort of the jam tomorrow uh, uh, nature of it all. So I think the two measures, uh, I think if we go back a step, some of the things that we, when we started looking at, um, so the, the first joint statement, which was the summer last year, the the ask of SIPFA at that point was very much focused in the reform, SIPFA last like at that phase, very much focused in the reform phase. So how could, you know, what would the changes need to be to local government financial reporting um, to, to to deal with some of those issues that we're all kind of um, we're all familiar with, um, and then that changed slightly at the end of the year. So um, these measures are things we're putting in in a short term basis, and have had to do at a degree of speed in response to to um, th other things that have gone in, gone on um, with, uh, across the across the system as we looked at the the reset and the recover phase. So that work is um, is still planned. Um, some of the things that we initially put on the table as part of the um, the short term changes were quite drastic, uh, and I think where we've landed is less drastic, and that's um, that might be disappointing to some people. The silver lining is actually I think the the two areas we're looking at, um, if we can look if we can start we're starting down the route of simplifying or taking things out. It's the, as we look at that reform piece. It, it's much uh, once you've taken something out and not missed it, it's much uh, harder. It's much easier, easier then to argue that it doesn't need to, you know, it doesn't need yeah. to, to to go back in. Um, and then I think the only other thing I would say is that at the moment we we have to have an IFRS compliant code. That's not a for last act decision. That's that's kind of that's sort of set out basically baked into the legislation. That's sort of the legislative framework. And so we do have to deal with what's there in terms of the the kind of the underlying standards um so um so i i share the frustration um and we are very keen to get on with the the, the that that longer term piece of work because um yeah it would be good to be in a situation where local authorities felt that their accounts were um were better reflective uh of what users need than than, than they are at the moment great thanks for that Ian. now we've got a whole bunch of questions that have come in i'm going to take them in the order that are there some have come in anonymously. I don't know if that's by conscious choice of the person putting it up there or, or a tech issue, uh, but uh, no need to uh, uh, to be anonymous unless you really want to, I suppose. But anyway, let's take the questions. So firstly, from Michelle White, uh, how do you expect time to be saved for practitioners and auditors to aid the recovery, as will still be expected to evidence that asset values remain appropriate at the reporting date when calculated using indexation? And require a valuation exercise undertaken to provide assurance. Uh, Ian, do you or one of the team want to have a go at that one? So, um, so I think it's uh, so, and I should have said this so at the, the outset. So, we're not mandating an approach. We're not. We're we're making. We're permitting an approach. So, indexation will be permissible. There's nothing. You know, at the moment, the proposal isn't that you have to do it. It's that there's an option there that isn't available to practitioners at the moment. Um, I know because it wasn't that long ago that I was uh, auditing local authority accounts that 
uh, the indices would be used as part of that exercise to demonstrate that your valuation date hadn't your valuation at, at balance sheet date hadn't moved materially from the uh, the last time uh, the asset was was valued. Uh, and often those conversations were difficult and then made more difficult because uh, local authorities weren't permitted to adjust for for indexation. So I think they should be able to short you know, that that should make that conversation uh, easier. Um, yes, there will still need to be evidence. Um, uh, that's that's just true of everything that goes in your accounts and frankly should be. Um, so I, I do think it was one of the things we are, that, that's in the consultation is is whether we would um, we or somebody else would effectively provide the indices. So we would be saying for this type of asset, the right index, the right index to use or an appropriate index to use would be. I don't know whether it would be it would be bill costs, for example, or it would be uh, something you know pegged to a to a market value. Uh, and again, I know auditors use those tools as part of um, as part of the the assurance process. Uh, and again, that would you know that would give pra preparers something that they can hang those judgments off that maybe makes those conversations a bit easier. Uh, and then I, the other scenario we were we've been working through is. Um, if we accept, whether we like it or not, if we accept that we probably will see modified audit opinions um, as part of the reset, and I suspect that property valuations will be one of those areas where uh, audits, audit opinions will be modified, actually as preparers and uh, CFOs, you're in a situation where you may, you, you may not have had full audit assurance over a balance uh, for, for two years because it's been modified. Um, and you can then use a valuation point and, in, and indices to give yourself some comfort that the number that's going in the accounts is, it, you know, is materially, uh, is, is true and fair and in line with in line with the code. So some of this is also trying to think about what are the scenarios that um, that that might be that might play out during that during that recovery period. We can't do it one size fits all. Uh, it's impossible to sit stand to set standards for every you know for, so. It has to be sort of one size fits all. We, we can't kind of create a standard for every individual scenario. But what we're trying to do is create some options that as you work through that two to three years with your as preparers and auditors, um, there are options available that, that might help in, uh, in specific circumstances. Thank you. OK, we've got a whole bunch of questions coming in, which is terrific. Uh, almost all on the PPE and indexation and related matters. I think I have seen one, possibly two on pension. So I'm going to focus on the, uh, the indexation uh, and just continue taking them in the order that we have them. So this one is from Anonymous. Can you please explain what you would expect an audit, audit bodies to do in 23, 24 if they've already commissioned valuations from their valuers? Yeah. So, uh, so because it's not mandated, if you wanted to use the uh, the valuation that you've got, um, yep. you can absolutely use the valuation that you've got. Um, one of the things that we've uh, we're 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 thinking through is a uh, effectively, and again, we want we don't want to be overly prescriptive because we're not sure that that helps everybody. But we also don't want to create a situation where uh, we're dragging people back into a pack. And actually, if you're in a situation where you can maintain the normal running of the way that you close your accounts, well, actually, that's better in the recovery than uh, than kind of than resetting everyone to a, co a lower common denominator and uh, and everyone's got a you know the equivalent mountain to to, to climb. So, um, so there's nothing that would say that you can't use the uh, the valuation that you've obtained this year, uh, and equally. Uh, there's nothing to say that if you haven't valued assets this year, you can get an appropriate, you could get an appropriate index and, um, yeah. you know, and, and use those. So um, we're not saying that um, you must index. We're saying that it, it it's permissible um, if it would be helpful in certain situations. OK, thank you for that. Next question uh, on the sort of practical consequences of indexation and audit. So indexation, unless the indices are mandated, then there's potential for long discussions with the auditor as to the choice of indices to be used. And also, as this is a change of valuation of approach, won't that create extra audit work as they'll look to, they, i.e. auditors, will look to evaluate the effect of the of the switch?
Ian? I've just lost the question and I was trying to... Uh... Ah, do you want me to read it out again, Ian? Yeah, sorry, I was trying so, to... Uh, unless the indices are mandated, okay, yeah. then there's a potential for long discussions yeah. with the auditor as to the choice of indices and also the change of approach. May Won't that create extra audit work as auditors will have to evaluate the effect of the switch? So, so uh, I think so, so it may do in certain circumstances, but um, as I said, in my experience, and, and it'll be different for but in my experiences, those conversations would already be happening between auditors and preparers, yeah. particularly on assets which haven't been valued during, um, you know, during the year. So, uh, uh, and, and I know some local authorities, particularly larger ones, just to get through the valuation, will value at a point in time, so, which is not necessarily the end of March. So, may value end of December or even you know end of September in, in, in some cases. So there's that kind of um that uncertainty that's there between the you know between the valuation date and I think it, it, it is always going to be there. So um I don't know whether it will be indices will be mandated or or suggested, but um again we're interested in um if people don't think it's going to make a difference then we're interested in hearing that but we're also interested in hearing what would make a difference so indexation might work if it was mandated if you know if the indices were mandated or or prescribed well that might be um you know that that's useful for us to 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 understand um what it means is that you'll be able to point to the code and say that the code allows you to do it yeah. which at the moment you can't yeah and that question thanks for that and that question was from John Newton apologies John I didn't read out your uh, your name Next one is from uh, Sean McEwen. Uh, so take a, says, I, I, I take on board your comments about the timing being less than ideal, and to an extent that's beyond SIPFA's control, uh, but then goes on to say, but surely the indexation proposal is unworkable for any council intending to achieve a May deadline for 23-24, as we'd need the indices mid-April at the latest to account for this year. I think it's an extension of the last question, really, isn't it, Ian? So sure. So um, so uh, I, I agree that and the timing isn't um, isn't ideal. And we didn't. You know, this wasn't something that Lit for Sass, Lit, Sit for Lassac, apologies had in its work plan. Um, uh, so uh, until sort of well, the autumn, the end of the autumn last year. So um, so again, we can apologise for that. But we sort of it is what it is. Um, we're hoping. So the consultation is out now. We're hoping that there's a direction of travel here that preparers can start to use. So. Um, it may be that that preparers want to start, you know, you want to start thinking about, uh, well, if we, if we were going to use this approach, uh, or first of all, is is this approach will this be appropriate for us? And if we are going, if we do think it is, you can start to make some moves in those directions, including speaking to your valuers about um, what appropriate indices might, you know, what, what, might be. So you can start to to prepare for that. Um, realistically, we know that um, whilst councils may prepare accounts for the end of May. Um, and we'll do in lots of cases. Some won't because some aren't in the position to be able to, to do that yet. Yep. And we also know that uh, obviously the whilst there is a backstop date for 23, 24 accounts, it's very likely that the focus in the for the rest of the vast majority of the rest of 2024 is going to be on clearing the clearing the backlog. Uh, so um so where you've got accounts which are uh, 2020, so 22, 23 and, and earlier, I suspect there will be a, a lot of activity happening in you know, dealing with those years, which might mean that uh, actually, the, you know, whilst the accounts are prepared, they may not be audited or touch, you know, much done in anger with them after that until uh, slightly later in the year. And whilst you prepare uh, numbers in your unaudited accounts, often the numbers in your unaudited accounts and your audited accounts are different. Um, and so there is still a window where some of this work can happen. Uh, and I think one of the things that's, I think, implicit in the wider suite of systems measures is that we want that recovery to be as quickly as it, that recovery to be as quick as it possibly can, subject to local circumstances. So if you're in a situation where you could carry out a piece of work towards the end of this year that allows you to uh, move on from a, a, a limitation of scope or a, a disclaimed opinion in a uh, in a number of areas. Well, actually, it would be better to be able to have that option open to you than than, than not. So, um, so us the window now is tight, and I totally appreciate that. In reality, it, by the time we get to the sort of the the backstop date for twenty three twenty four, there should be enough time for preparers and auditors to to work through this in a sensible fashion. 
Thank you, Ian. I'm going to take two questions together now as they relate to IFRS 16. Uh, so the first of those from Anonymous, uh, are there implications for IF, IFRS 16 in terms of the valuation of PPE for 24-25? But then a little bit further down, I'm just scrolling to it, so bear with me, from uh, Alan Saltmarsh. Uh, the aim of this consultation is to reduce the burden on preparers and auditors to aid with the reform phase. Was IFRS 16 considered during this, he asks? From discussions with our auditors, it seems like an oversight that this significant standard change will be the biggest pressure on auditors uh, and preparers. Sorry, my screen has just uh, just moved. So hang on a moment. I was halfway through reading out Alan's question and then uh, it moved on my screen. Uh, bear with me. Uh, sorry. Uh, I think it's popped anyone... into, it's showing us being answered now. Ah, right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so thanks for helping out there. Uh, so from discussions with our auditors, Alan goes on, it seems like an oversight that this significant standard change will be the biggest pressure on auditors and preparers for 24-25. And so a deferral would support that aim. Uh, so two sort of related questions on IFRS 16 there, uh, Ian, uh, or indeed others of the team, if that's helpful. Uh, so I think the honest answer is IFRS 16 has been, we're now, I think, the only bit of government that doesn't account using IFRS 16 yeah. uh, and uh, have done and have been now for, for a little while. Um, and in all of this, uh, we need to maintain, you know, we may need to maintain some credibility, frankly. Yeah. Um, uh, and if we continue to push that down the road, uh, we don't. And so yeah. I think we've just reached a point where Sit for Lassac were of a view that um, that we needed to push ahead with IFRS 16. Uh, local Perhaps I could really emphasise that one as well, uh, Ian, because I, I really do agree with you. You know, This position of being the only part of the UK public or private sector not to have adopted standards that are you know just, just dealt with routinely elsewhere. Uh, really damages in my view the reputation of the sector you know and this at a time when actually what we're trying to do is to restore that 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 reputation and, and, and to uh, push for another deferral i mean i understand all the practical consequences of course but i i, I think it uh, it really would would have been the wrong uh the wrong the wrong step so i think i mean i think that, that, that's quite blunt but it really is as simple i think it's really as simple as that yeah. is that um it, it's just not it's just not tenable for us not to do it now. Uh, uh, and I think we'd had, you know, we'd had, and it, before my time, but I think we'd had uh, some understanding from FRAB and other stakeholders that we needed more time. We've had the we've had the extra time now, um, but um, uh, but we can't continue as we are, um, and you know, and maintain sort of, you know, the the, the, the credibility and the reputation of the, the sort of the, the the accounting in the sector. At a time when we're also asking for lots of other things, uh, which yeah. which which uh, which which, which we need to happen. So, I've heard this a lot, and I, and I have some sympathy. Uh, you know, I understand the burden, but um, but we've sort of run out of road with it now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Let me move on because uh, Stephen Sheen uh, wants to uh, ask a question. Uh, but. If, so is it the intention that indexation will be a new type of transaction that will need to be presented separately from valuation in the PPE analysis? It's traditionally been the view that the basis of measurements in certified valuation should be presented in the financial statements. I don't know about that one, Ian. So I, I think there will need to be some disclosure. I think it's a fair point, Stephen. I think there will need to be some disclosure that reflects the valuation, you know, what the valuation basis would be. Um, at the moment, there'd be a, you know, a, a note which would effectively say when, 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 how much of what was valued and on, and on what basis. So I don't think there needs to be a, a huge disclosure. I think that it can be reflected in an accounting policy and it can be reflected in a, yeah. in a note. But yeah, users will users should be able to understand where indexation has been used uh, and where it hasn't uh, and as i said it it's it might be new to local government but it's not new you know the frem has permitted uh, indexation in central government and the nhs yeah. for, for for decades 
it's so um it's not new ground in that sense okay next question then from uh anonymous so uh increasingly public sector bodies around the world are using international public sector accounting standards ipsas well i recognize the development of accrual accounting in the uk was ahead of these are the proposed changes consistent with ipsasby's uh, approach has the board had regard to ipsasby's position before I hand over to Ian, I, I, I ought to sort of point out that my predecessor, the chair of SIP for ASAC, is now indeed on the, the IPSASB uh, board. So uh, I can assure you that you know, there's some sort of pretty uh, effective links there. But Ian, is there anything in particular on that question uh, that you wanted to pick up? So we're, we, we are conscious of IPSAS uh, and we, you know, and there are, bit, there are references to IPSAS in other bits of the code. But technically, we have to use IFRS as the basis for for the, for the code, so that has to be the the starting point. Um, I don't know if, if those of you who have followed some of what uh, Treasury are doing at the moment, or have been doing around um, their thematic review on uh, on property valuations, that has um, that has been quite heavily influenced by the the IPSAS standards. So it's something we're aware of um, in the standard setting world. But at the at the moment, we. Um, you know, it can be it's useful as a reference for a departure, but it would it is still technically a departure from the the kind of the you know, the underlying the underlying standard. Um, and I suppose there are whilst there are there are some variations on themes. The underlying the thrust of the underlying standards, you know, IPSAS is based on IFRS, so um, so the, the read across is kind of inherently there. Um, okay. But it is something particularly when we've looked at. Um, I know when we've the feedback we provided to Treasury on um, the property valuations. You know, we've pointed them at Ipsas, and and they've taken you know, it. So uh, there's a live conversation in certain in certain areas, uh, and it may well be when we look at the reform bit, um, there's an opportunity to look at what happens elsewhere in the world and whether that's more appropriate for a public sector setting than than where we are at the moment. Thanks. Ian. Now we've got uh, at least a dozen unanswered questions, and please keep them coming. And we've got twenty minutes left, so I'm going to try and sort of rattle through uh, a little bit. Uh, if there are ones at the end that we've not been able to answer, we'll make sure that that's, that's picked up with uh, with written answers. So, uh, from Anonymous, will these measures be optional? Uh, well, yes, we, we, we've picked that one up in the discussion so far. If so, and we choose not to adopt them because they're too late for 23, 24, uh, and then here's the key bit of part of the question, are we correct in saying our auditors won't be able to charge additional fees for the additional audit work they might undertake compared to auditing accounts which incorporate these measures. Fees were, after all, set before these measures were were announced. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure that we've got anyone on the panel who can give an absolutely definitive answer on that. I mean, I know that the issue of the sort of fees and commercial relationships with the firms you know, is you know, at the forefront of a lot of the thinking on the whole kind of system changes here. I don't know, Ian, or possibly Mike Newbury, if you're able to, to I mean, say anything on, on that one. Happy to have a go, but as you say, it's sort of PSAA are really the, the you know it would be for them to to make the that that um, determination. What and I don't know whether anyone from PSA is on the in on the, on the webinar, but I will speak for them. And if I've got it wrong, then we can correct it later. I think if they were here, what they would say is they want to look at what the the suite of measures might mean, and then they anticipate there will be an exercise which is looking at. Um, what fee what fee variations may or may not be appropriate um, against that that backdrop, but the principle being, if um, if there's audit work that isn't happening um, and it's included in the fee, well, it you know there's there's no fee for that work. If there's audit work that does happen that's not included in the fee, then then it would work the other way. So um, I think fees. I don't envy PSAA the task. I think fees is um, is something that that will be worked through, but it's. It's acknowledged that there will be there's a piece of work that needs to happen to 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 sort of um, to square that away uh, in a in a kind of an equitable fashion. So, Mike, okay. if you want to add anything? Uh, no, that's that's very much my understanding of the of the position, uh, and uh, I think PSA took the opportunity to to touch on this in their own webinar uh, last last week. So I don't think I can usefully add anything more. Okay, let's change tack slightly. Uh, because uh, these proposals include pensions, and John Newton has got a question on that. Before we come to that, though, Lynn Bradley uh, asks us, if, if you like, a sort of slightly more philosophical or principles-based question. Uh, do you think that these proposals dilute reporting and audit quality? Uh, I mean, I think 
you know, the answer to that is we are trying to find the best practical solution uh, to help get us out of a very difficult situation whilst minimising any compromise to uh, financial reporting uh, standards. Uh, as has been said, you know, indexation is used in other sectors, uh, so I think it's a perfectly reasonable uh, reasonable approach to uh, to take on that. I don't know, Ian, if, if you would like to add anything to that. I think I think what we've tried to do is stay. So we have we have had an awful lot of conversations about at what point do a set of accounts move away from a true and fair view, and yeah. at what point does an audit cease to be an audit? I think it's sort of it's fair to say. Um, and there is a real um, you don't want to damage something uh, beyond repair in the you know in, in an attempt to deal with the the sort of the issue that we that we've got. So. Where we answered so where we've landed, we had there were some more um there were some more drastic considerations that Sit for Lassac made at the outset, and where we've landed are probably the less drastic uh, end of things. Um, but that means we're close enough to the underlying principles of the accounting, sort of the financial reporting yeah. standards, that we can still maintain that true and fair view. Um yeah. and I think um so does it dilute um uh like hopefully hope it, it probably does a little but hopefully not too too much yeah. and in some cases you might argue that you get a you get to a better place because you've got a bit more clarity around uh around what's being around what's being disclosed yeah. it's not an important audit. question though that what, yeah. what we will come back to as we move Indeed. into the, the on the audit quality side mike newbury has helpfully prompted me to uh highlight that the audits will remain isa compliant uh, and these, you know, the FRC uh, have been involved in the in the development of the proposal, so that there's, uh, you know, not a dilution on on the audit side. Now, I'm conscious that there are pensions issues as well as uh, PPE and related matters. So John Newton asks for the change relating to pensions notes. If I've understood correctly, is it just the sensitivity analysis tables that are no longer required? John's point being that that's one of the easiest and quickest notes to prepare uh, and relatively easy to audit as well. Uh, so whilst appreciating any help, he says, not sure that one's going to save anyone uh, too much too much time. Ian? Uh, yeah, so um, they've not been... I, mean, I, so I, I sort of agree in part. I think the idea is if there's less, less in the accounts, it's less to prepare, prepare and less to less to audit it's it's not much more you know much more sophisticated than that um what i would say is there is a very live conversation at the moment across all of the relevant authorities about uh, accounting for local government pension schemes so i think it, it will be something we come back to very quickly um but i probably can't say too much more of that about that at the moment um we were looking, you know, we we were asked to look at um at th sort of three areas: property valuations, uh, pensions, and then we also spent some time looking at opening balances and prior period adjustments. Um, and this was uh this was what was uh practically yeah, pragmatically doable, I suppose, uh, around yeah. pensions in, in the the window that we had available to uh, consider and uh, and action things. Um, but it it is something that. Um, I know Sit for Lassac are very keen to come back to, and I know that there are other parts of um, uh, other interested parties in and around FRAP who are keen to have a broader conversation about uh, local government accounting for local government pensions. Okay, and then a couple of quite specific technical questions that hopefully we can we can give almost yes no answers to, not quite perhaps. But uh, anonymous asks if indexation is used, but we've already obtained an up to date valuation that's materially different from the index value. Can we ignore the external valuation and use the index figure? Uh, do you want to uh, quickly do that one, Ian? Uh, it's quite a tricky I, one, isn't it? It's quite a tricky one. I mean, I think if you've got better available information, use the best available. Yeah. Use the best available information would yeah. be my 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 response. And that that would be the starting principle. I, I think that's but, the starting principle. Yeah. Early conversations with auditors as well, of course, is, is the obvious message that always always helps there. And I think in that situation, if you've done an indexation and you've got uh, an external valuation and it's vastly different, you might want to go back and check with your valuer why they're vastly yeah. different. And, and if you're looking, you know, I know auditors will often look for how management have challenged what their expert have done. If you want an example of how to do that, that would be a, a ready-made one for me. Okay, and then question from Greg. Nice to see you, Greg. Uh, 
The change is limited to the other land and building class of PPE. Is there a technical reason why HRA dwellings are excluded? Uh, can't remember that there was. And unless anyone in the team is willing to help me, we probably just need to take that away. Let's suggest we provide right. a written answer to that yeah. one then. So, that, um, that's quite specific and we just need to make sure that we get it right. It's a good point. And then we've got some uh, a group of questions on the. So I'm going to take three together from Michelle White, anonymous, and Lynn Clayton, which is all about uh, the sort of choice of index. So Michelle just says, "Thank you." SIP for provided indexation rates would assist. Then anonymous says, "I'm a bit confused on which values you index based on. Uh, should it be 22, 23 in all cases, and other cases where the index should be based on earlier years?" And then Lynn Clayton asks, are there thoughts about what approach could be used for land, as there are no recognised indices for land? Uh, so slight differences in all those questions, but on, on a sort of common theme. So maybe we could take the answers to them together. Uh, so I think, uh, so there's one there about indices. So that's in the consultation and we're open to, uh, and I don't know that it would be, I don't think it would be SIP for LASAC, but it may be SIP for would provide something through a bulletin that might help with that in a similar way that we provided information in an index or an appendices, sorry, to the uh, the bulletin on infrastructure assets uh, towards the end of last, sort of the early part of last year, probably now. Um, so that's that's a very live conversation. And we've, you know, we've heard, we, so we just want to understand uh, yeah. would that be useful and, and also who would be best placed to do that. Uh, and we then need to work out how we do that. So do we put them in the code? Or do we provide a, do we, are they provided in a, through another, through another mechanism? In terms of the start date, uh, we have had endless conversations about this. Uh, and again, so I think there were two views. There were, there was a view that if you thought that 22, 23 was a true and fair position, you could just index from 22, 23. We also had a conversation about, do you use a la the latest audited point? So, um, but, but appreciating that in some instances that might go back a number of years. And then there's a third scenario, which is you have to use the latest, the last time the asset was valued and then applied the indices. So in the exposure draft at the moment, I think we're saying 22, 23, um, but that's something that SIFL ASAC will want to, want to come back and yeah. consider as part of the, the final uh, final analysis. Um, uh, on land, there are land value measures out there, whether they're recognised indices is a good point, Lynn, um, but that's probably similar to the point Greg's raised about um, HRA dwellings and we probably just would like to we probably it would benefit from taking that away and just sure. uh, just thinking it back through and then a quick question from Stephen Sheen this is uh, more the sort of philosophical rather than technical detail point you know Stephen's point is that uh, any set of accounts uh, is based on estimates uh, and that uh, if there are then lengthy delays between the draft accounts and the audit of them you're going to see just not because the estimates were wrong, but just because life's like that, uh, those estimates uh, unravel in the months and years waiting for audit sign-off, as Stephen puts it. Uh, and in the meantime, of course, users will have taken any relevant, relevant decisions based on the published unaudited accounts. And the question, which I think is a really good one that we should probably need to take away, how can we give more status then to the unaudited uh, accounts uh, in recognition of that uh, of that issue that's going to be with us for a year or two at least until the system is is reset. It's probably one for us to take away, Ian, but I don't know if there's anything uh, yeah, I think that you want to say on it. I, I think so. So at the moment, um, it's not a sit for LASAC driven. So the the prominence is through the legislation. So it's what yeah. local authorities have to do because um, the statute book says they've got to do it. Um, there is a. It's very unusual. You don't see it in other settings. You don't publish a set of numbers that haven't been audited uh, yeah. and pretty much anywhere else. Um, and the reason, obviously, is not necessarily about users or local authorities. It's actually for it's for it's about local electors and them being able to exercise um, their rights. So uh, I don't think it's something that will will we'll, uh, I don't think there's capacity within any of the system partners to do that as part of these measures. But I think there are some important questions. That we should we'll come back to as part of the the reform um the reform piece i mean the, the way the legislation is framed at the moment that's what's driving the 31st of may because you're you have to you have to um make your accounts available for electors from yeah. this working day in june so um so there are a whole load of things there to unpack 
I think if you step back from it all, the question needs to be not just about unaudited accounts, it's actually how do you get local authorities to a position where they feel that there's value in their accounts full stop in lots of cases. So yeah. um, uh, I think if we could answer that one, I'd be some of the rest of it probably unpacks from unpacks from that. Then the next question is from Victoria Dale, but I think the answer to this, Victoria, has been provided since you put your question in there. So would the indexation approach in 24-25 be expected to be adopted uh, by authorities that had their accounts signed off and everything up to date, or could the usual approach for professional valuations be used? And as Ian has said, you know, we're very keen that those authorities that are in a good place aren't, if you like, sort of you know, uh, dragged back a bit by any of this. Uh, and so absolutely, uh, the answer is, you know, in, the, in those circumstances, uh, you would be able to uh, to continue with valuations the ordinary way. Ian, is there anything I should add on that? Uh, no, I think that's no. we've sort of covered that one. Then Alison Gebert has three uh, linked uh, questions. So, uh, do the proposals allow for a mixed approach? I so could you uh, value commission valuations for the majority of your assets, but then in a few where that information may be tricky to get hold of, those being the ones that tend to cause delays, uh, could you then use indexation in those cases, i.e. is it possible to use valuation and indexation in the same set of accounts? Yes, I think is a short yep. answer. I think we're envisaging that, it, that, that you would be able to have a, a mixed model. Uh, and then your second question, Alison, I think is the one uh, that Greg raised in another format, so we might have to provide a written answer. Uh, so do the indexation proposals apply to all PPE items, blah, 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 but not to investment properties? Definitely don't in, uh, index investment properties. What about council dwellings? We need to come back on that one. Yeah, the, the key point to emphasize is this it won't apply to investment properties. Yeah. So investment properties, you still need to do, you still need to, you know, um, absolutely. Yeah, valued. Yeah, because the, 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 those valuations, you know, are uh, unarguably uh, kind of more sensitive and more critical than, than some of the other PPE uh, points. Uh, if there are published indices used and we've had a full valuation, but the value of prepared valuations with reference to different indices, would this cause audit issues? Uh, so I think I think it's again it's about best available best available information. So if you've got a professional, if you've got a valuer, who's, you've got a valuation certificate. Um, that should that should be the best available information. What you yeah. might be able to do is use. The, the published indices to sense check what the, you know, to demonstrate that you provided some um, some challenge to your expert uh, around those yeah. valuations. And then an anonymous attendee comes back on the IFRS 16 point, uh, expressing the view uh, that this is just more pressure uh, on, the, uh, on the system uh, at the wrong time and arguing for a deferral. Uh, have SIPRA undertaken a survey of practitioners and auditors on the issue well i mean we have consulted on ifrs 16 uh, quite a lot i mean i, I respect the uh, the view uh, about pressure on the system but i just come back to the point that i made earlier uh, you know we are the only part of the uk public or private sector that that doesn't do this and you know have been for some time because of the uh, the deferrals so uh, i don't think the position on that is changing but i, I respect the uh, the point that's been made uh, another anonymous, if an authority was to index for one year, but then undertake valuations the following year, and the audit found an error, would this lead to prior year adjustments because of materiality? I think the answer to that might depend an awful lot on the particular circumstances, but I don't think there would be anything wrong with having done the valuation indexation approach previously, but Ian? Uh, so yeah, it would, I suppose it would depend on what the nature of the error was. Um, uh, but uh, what I would say is, where you have environments, so you you're not allowed to just use indexation ad infinitum. At some point, you have to go and get evaluation done, um, and where you, and that happens. So in central government, the NHS, you'll see quite big movements on valuation years because it's been tracked in line with an index, and then uh, and then evaluation happens, and so you see a movement up or, or down. Um, uh, and it doesn't normally result in in a in a in a prior period adjustment. So um, uh, unless you've done unless it was demonstrating that you, something had been done wrong, uh, I don't think necessarily it would, or it shouldn't necessarily. Oh. 
Okay, another anonymous one then. Uh, so the proposal is to add indexation to the current value measurement bases. The code also indicates that current value is usually determined by appraisal of evidence and is normally undertaken by professionally qualified valuers. So if an authority wanted to use indexation for PPE assets, would this have to be certified by the by the valuers, uh, Ian? Uh, so I think that depends where we land in terms of, so if we're talking about prescribed indices, uh, potentially not. Yeah. Um, so again, you know, sometimes your valuations will be desktop valuations, um, uh, you know, depending on what you're getting from your, your valuer anyway. Um, not all valuers go out and look at all assets every year. Um, so I think we're envisaging, um, we're not necessarily envisaging it would be certified, but it's it's a good question. It's one we we we'll probably need to to consider before we release the final uh, the final uh, version of the code. Now I've got two more questions in the chat, so the timing's working out really well. I'm going to take them in the opposite order to the one they're asked in. So Lynn says, then uh, Clayton, sorry, if there is a material difference between the two approaches, indexation and valuation, auditors are likely to ask more questions. That is true. Uh, I would also add to that that practitioners also uh, ought to be adding, asking those uh, those questions. Greg McIntosh then raises uh, more of a long term point, uh, asking, can we be assured that SIP for LASAC will be resisting Treasury pressure to move to DRC, depreciated replacement costs for highways infrastructure assets? Ian? Uh, so I don't think that's where the board is at the moment. So the board is moving towards uh, towards uh, DRC, uh, DRC, and I think, but with uh, with a view that we would look for that we'd want some sort of reasonable and pragmatic uh, yeah. way of delivering DRC for the sector. Um, the honest answer, there, Greg, is it's it, whilst we're still doing whilst we still have a work a live work stream for SIP for LASAC, and we still have work going on. It is somewhat being parked at the moment. Uh, as I said earlier, we don't envisage that we'll be introducing any new accounting for, um, I think we're saying 1st of April 27 is likely to be the first time that we that we were bringing in any, any change. So uh, that's the position at the moment, but there's still a lot of water to go under a lot of bridges before we, uh, yeah. before we get anywhere. Uh, and some of us will have been around and remember highways, highway network assets, uh, you know, so we know, we know that that's, not necessarily easy. Okay, I want to try and wrap things up. So Michelle just asks, uh, having published indices will help practitioners to challenge asset valuations, but as this hasn't been readily available in the past, it could create additional pressures rather than the same time as auditors may expect to see a comparison exercise. I think rather than trying to answer that, this we should emphasize, you know, there's been a huge amount of discussions across the system uh, on all of these things. You see, you know, Mike from the NAO is on, on, on the call, for instance. So uh, you know, it's not that we've come up with these proposals from a sort of pure accounting point of view. That you know, been very, very live discussions with auditors to you know, to try and think through all of these you know potential uh, pitfalls because you know the the intent is to, to to save time on both sides of the house. Ian, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or indeed. Uh, I mean, I would say that um, so, so published in, so indices are readily available and have been for years. They're kind of an estate you know they're quite a well established things so and I, I know a number of local authorities will have used them um if you were looking at so industry indexation is likely to be something that we keep because if you look at where treasury are, are moving in terms of their the you know property valuations in the in the frame i think it will be it will be something that um that, that remains so uh i suppose it's a useful thing to get into um but yeah i mean i think the key thing is that what we would hope is that there is a sensible conversation between preparers and auditors in the next we're talking about two year two to three year window yeah. and what we need is a sensible conversation about actually if we did it this way what would the what would the implications be if we did it if you know if we if we don't do it this way what would the implications be and then there are some decisions that can be made um uh you know based on where where either party is i think Okay, so I'm going to extend things for, for two minutes just to wrap up the final two questions and say thank yous and then we'll finish because I'm conscious that people have other things to do. So Anonymous does ask, would it be simpler to pause valuations and make indices available uh, if people wanted a better idea of how valuations might have worked? Well, I mean, you know, as we've stressed, there is sort of optionality in this. And then the final question, has the 31st of May deadline been discussed? 
Uh, it seems that you don't think some will achieve this. Uh, I think that would be fair to say that we don't expect everyone to manage it. Uh, and that will be due to prior years audits outstanding. Wouldn't it be fairer to extend everyone else's, giving us more time to get an accurate set of accounts and no need for these changes as we'd be able to have better discussions with auditors around issues? And I guess the balance that we've been trying to strike here is wanting you know, as much information out in the public domain as early as possible, because that's a good component of financial reporting. And again, this point about not wanting to uh, hold up those authorities that are in a situation of being able to publish good unaudited accounts and indeed get their audits of those done uh, done swiftly. So, uh, you know, that, that's why we've, uh, I mean, obviously the 31st of May is not actually a SIP for asset choice, but I mean, you know, uh, that's why uh, that approach has been taken within the system. Ian or Mike, I don't know if there's any final words you'd want to add on that one. No, I mean, I'd just echo, so it's not a sit last like decision, it's yeah. uh, it's a DLAC decision. Um, and there is a question, I should say, was a question in their consultation asking about the 31st yeah. of May and and the, the, the timescales. So, um, so uh, again, I sort of, I, I accept the point, but it's not something that, yeah. um, and there is a there is a very there's a real risk with this that we drag people into the pack yeah. rather than um, uh, you know what we'd like to do is get back to a place where um, accounts are being prepared and audited quickly and you know and, and on time so that um, uh, so uh, you know so so yeah that's there will be local decisions that need to be made around around some of that and some authorities will want to get on and do it in the 31st by the 31st of may and some may decide for valid reasons that, that they're not able to do that okay mike any final thoughts on that one? Oh well i think the only observation i'd add uh add here is that um all of these proposals the DLUC proposals where the consultations just closed uh, as did ours last week and the the work that sit for LASAC colleagues have done are all coming at the same central yeah. question which is how do we move this system from where it is to accounts being produced on a timely basis and audited on a timely yeah. basis and auditors fulfilling their full range of statutory functions including the VFM reporting on a much more timely basis that's that's the big prize that we're all endeavouring to do our, our, our best to achieve, recognising that you know the circumstances are, are to say the say it uh, mildly, certainly not where we would want to, to be right now. So we, we have yeah. a collective will to try and do something about this, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. You wouldn't choose to start from here, but given this is where we are, we, we absolutely all need to make sure uh, that we get out of this position as soon as possible and never uh, never let it. Uh, happen again. I'm going to draw things to a close there. So thanks very much to our panelists, Ian Murray and Mike Newbury. Thanks also to Ben, David uh, and Stephen in the background uh, who've been doing uh, uh, a lot of the, the, the heavy lifting uh, work on this on behalf of SIPFA. Thanks also to Monica for making everything run uh, so smoothly from a technical basis. And thanks to all of you uh, for some really, uh, really good questions and you know fair challenges uh we all recognize that you know this is not a sort of situation where there's just one obvious answer leaping out so there's going to be uh different opinions and that's you know that's good and healthy that we uh we discuss those please do uh add your responses to the formal consultation i hope webinars like this are useful i've certainly found it really informative uh but it is uh essential uh that you also formally represent your views uh, in the response to the consultation on or before the 28th of March. I think that's it. Thanks all of you for your time. Uh, it's really, really appreciated. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, the next one of these uh, and indeed seeing the responses to the consultation. Thanks very much. Let's close things now. <laughs>